So, like I said earlier on the side, honored to be here with you and, and uh, have you on stage, and we have to do it more often and not just chat while we're no, on thanks stage. Thanks for having me. My partner, Howard, was here last year, yep. and uh, when you sent me the invitation this year, the first thing I did was ask Howard, is it worth coming to? And he said, definitely. Oh, so. good. So I'm, I'm glad he validated that. Yeah. That's a good person to ask. Yeah. Um, so give us, uh, in your words, just a quick little intro, and I've got many notes and memories as well, but I want it to come from you. Um, uh, two minutes on the pre-venture world of Josh, the three companies uh, plus and exits, and, and the profile of first round these days and what you're focused on with your team. Sure, so I'm an accidental VC. I started off as an entrepreneur. Um, and I started off my first company, I co-founded a company in 91 called Infonautics. And we were in the right time in the right place. We were building an online service. This was before the web browser came out. So it was on Prodigy, CompuServe, and America Online, 300, 1200, 2400 baud. And um, you know, as the internet grew, we, we moved to the internet. And I graduated college as an undergrad in 93. And the company went public in 96. Um, left there and started another company called Half.com, which quickly became the largest online marketplace for used books, music, and movies on the web. And uh, if there was ever a month and ever a year to get a phone call for acquisition, it would be February of 2000, when <laughs> I'd rather be lucky than smart. <laughs> so eBay called and, and bought that company, and I stayed there. Um, and grew that to about a quarter billion dollars in sales before I left. And then I helped to found a third company called Turntide, which was an anti-spam router. They were trying to you know, do it at the protocol level rather than at the application level. And I'm not a statistician, but I kind of knew that the odds of my fourth company uh, being <laughs> an overwhelming, spectacular failure were overwhelmingly against me. So I decided to, uh, I guess as they say, trade in my green lightsaber for a red lightsaber and I uh, switched sides and became a VC. And um, you know, and during the time for those three companies, my first company, Infonautics, we had to raise $5 million to get the first product ship. We had to build our own data center. There were no colos. We had to buy expensive tandem hardware. We had a diesel generator out back. Like, you know, <laughs> it, was for, for, you know, it was just crazy to sort of figure out how to build an internet service. And it took $5 million to first product ship. Uh, fast forward a few years later, Half.com took about two to two and a half million dollars to get to first product ship. Turntide took 500 to 750. So it, in the course of those three companies, the cost to get to first product ship, not to succeed, but at least to get to market, had come down from 5 million to 500,000. Um, during the same time, the average venture fund tripled in size. And the average initial investment of a venture fund tripled in size. So you saw a 3x increase in, in, in check sizes, and you saw a 10x decrease in capital efficiency, that's a 30x gap. And that's when Howard and I decided to start First Round Capital, uh, a, a fund that was intended to uh, capitalize on that gap. Back then, it was novel. Today, you have hundreds of these micro VC funds pursuing a, a very similar strategy, which is trying to provide institutional capital to the earliest of stages. And that's, that's when we first met you at Digital that's, Railroad. That's it. That is when we first met. And I. Uh... I think we want to start with that kind of, what, what year was it that you and Howard started? End of 2004. Right, so just about then. And what I loved uh, in the early days with getting to know Josh and Howard, everybody, is uh, you could tell they were both entrepreneurs. They were hustlers. They were chasing everybody around and speaking to everybody really quickly. Um, and I think then and now still some of the you know, two of the most brilliant investors really focused early stage. Um, and helping people out. And one of the questions I think a lot of entrepreneurs have, I had it back then, um, is the signal, what are the signals from when you first meet to when you write a check that gets you the most excited? Because the story behind the scenes was when we first met, um, I pitched, uh, we met by uh, Scott Kernett, Mm -hmm. um, and we talked in a coffee shop, a noisy coffee shop in New York City that I couldn't hear myself, let alone answer the smart questions that I was getting, if anybody knows Kernet. Josh and Kernet have similarities of very direct, um, uh, great questions of which I couldn't keep up, or I felt like I couldn't keep up. And then we would talk every once in a while through New York Angels and others for about a year and a half. And it was always uh, very interesting, but we're, you know, it's not for us. And that lasted for about a year and a half. And then I pitched a demo conference. 
um, and you were the first person to grab me off stage and say, okay, we're interested now. <laughs> okay, and, I, and I'm not sure what happened over those, as an example, what, what do you think the, the kind of signals are? So I, I'm not sure that, you know, the world today is very different. Correct, but um, I mean, as an example, talk about today, not then. Um, it's just <laughs> as, you know. Uh, so, so much of, as a seed stage investor, the one thing you know when someone shows you a product um, or business plan is that the business plan is wrong and the product is wrong, right? The product, you know, the product you showed, showed us had nothing, you know, ultimately looked nothing like the product that, mm -hmm. that you brought to market and it continued to evolve. Um, so to some degree, what we've learned is so much of the decision is, is focused on the founder. Mm -hmm. um, what we're trying to do is understand how that founder thinks. And, and there are a few tools that you can use to try to figure that out. Um, it's very hard to ask a founder, how do you make decisions? Um, because that's very abstract. Um, but a product, for example, when you look at a product, even though you know it's wrong, a product is a synthesis of hundreds or thousands of decisions that were made over the prior six months, 12 months, however long they've been looking at it. So the product is a brilliant DVR for decisions. You right. could, you, you know, instead of try looking at a product and trying to fast forward to what is it going to look like, what we try to do is, is or what I try to do is, is look at a product and try to rewind to understand how you made the decisions that you made in the product. It, it's a good way of preserving intellectual honesty of, of why did you choose this versus that. So, so you know, I, I don't truly remember all of the, the, the rationale behind why we chose to invest or not, but it's, it's not atypical that after seeing you operate for a right. period of time, we had the ability to look at how you made decisions. Right. Um, you know, we, uh, and so is there an amount of time, I think it makes a lot of sense, and it's, uh, you know, is, so some of the challenges as the funding process try to be uh, uh, shortened, people want to move quickly, there's supply and demand opportunities, um, and there's not always that, sh that opportunity to see over time. Which is why we use the product as a proxy for that, right. because you could then sit down with the product and ask them, why did you choose this, or why did you choose that, or why didn't you do this, and what, what, what was the data that led you to do X versus Y? And it's a way to rewind 12 months right. to understand those decisions. And there are other things we look at, you know, besides for the normal intelligence, work ethic, integrity, and, and things. You know, one of the things that we've seen is uh, 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 some correlation between the entrepreneurs that we like to back and non-conformists. Um, if you look at the type of entrepreneur who does well in school, or the type of person that does well in school. To, you, know, you show up your first day of class and your teacher hands you a syllabus. And the syllabus is the roadmap for the semester. Here are the books, here are the homeworks, here's where the tests are, here's where the quizzes are. And, and as a student, you still have to work and you have to uh, 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 get to mastery of the content and you have to figure out how you're going to learn the material. But your teacher has handed you a roadmap and your job is to figure out how do you execute and follow that roadmap. Well, when you're, as you know, when you're starting a company, no one hands you a roadmap. Like, the job is to figure out the roadmap, not, right. not how to follow it. So one of the things that we also look for are, are what are the ways in the past that this founder, that he, or her, that he or she created their own roadmap? And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be like, I created a nonprofit when I was seven years old. But, you know, but did they create their own major in college? Did they join a club or did they cr start a club? Like, have they, have they ever gone off the conveyor belt of the status quo to create something new, to will something new to existence, no matter how big or small it is? That's, that, that's some of the other attributes that we look for in founders. It's kind of the, the hustler, the, DN, the DNA of somebody that doesn't always follow the path that's been left before. And, you know, if they want to do something, the, 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 the classic thing is, most entrepreneurs that I know that are successful uh, don't have the uh, don't have no in their vocabulary. No is really a not now. And what do I have to do to get you to a yes, or at least to a maybe, and then to a yes? Um, and it sounds like a very similar uh, situation. So if you look back, uh, you know, uh, reflect upon that, what's the one thing you learn as an entrepreneur that is, helps you the most being an early stage investor? It's interesting. I know. The easier answer to that is, what's the one thing that, as an entrepreneur that hurts me being a venture investor? Well, I can, we can get to that later. But I wanna, <laughs> I wanna... So um, I think having sat in the founder's chair, um, 
there's an understanding of, you know, I like to think, you know, that strong investors need to be, have strong empathy for founders. In that founders have such imperfect information. Founders have to make decisions, dozens of decisions every day, knowing that a large percentage of them will be wrong. Um, and, and so when you show up at a boardroom and you're dealing with imperfect information and unclear results and you're not sure whether there's traction or not, um, I think they're, you know, having sat in the chair of, and the role of founder, I hope, gives me some ability to sort of recognize the role of a VC. And the role of a VC is not to be driving the bus. The founder's driving the bus. Right. And, 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 and so, um, and, ha and, and having done it, having dealt with that crippling uncertainty of am I doing the right thing, um, you know, you, 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 you make decision after decision and you don't know whether those decisions were right until months or quarters later. Um, I think it's really important to have investors who could empathize with that and who don't come in um, with too, you know, and aren't so heavily prescriptive as if they, in the few hours per week or month that they spend on this, have the answers that, that you as the founder who've spent more time that day than they've spent in the past month thinking about right. this. Um, I think that I agree with you. I think that's very important and it relates to another question. So one of my biggest challenges, and I don't know if you had this challenge, but after being an entrepreneur for 18 years um, in several companies of which some succeeded, some failed, um, I was the doer. I was the CEO. You know, every single day you know if you're moving the ball forward. As a, as a, I think as a good venture capitalist, you're more, one is more of a coach, as you were mentioning. Um, in, and I, it, I, I fought with myself not to roll up my sleeves and get in in the early days. And I learned from my own mistakes and have, you know, five years now, think, still learning. But that was my biggest challenge. What was your biggest no, that challenge? Was, that, that's was funny, that, the that, was the, that was what I was going to talk about in terms of the hardest thing. So when a founder comes and presents with you, they're presenting their business or their recipe for how to build a good business. And, you know, they're saying this is, so, you know, this is my recipe. And, and, and so, you know, to, to really choose a cheesy, you know, metaphor, okay, so I'm going to make a brownie and here's my recipe. I'm going to have chocolate and sugar, I'm gonna, you know, cream, and I'm going to do this and that and that. And as an operator, what I would hear is I'd ignore the recipe and I'd focus on the ingredients the, in the beginning, like my first few years as a VC. So I'd say, wow, there's chocolate, there's sugar, there's cream. I could build a <laughs> kick-ass chocolate souffle with, that, with, with those ingredients. And I'd get so excited about the recipe that I would want to bake that I forgot the fact that I was pretty much funding the recipe that the founder was pitching me. And, 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 and there was, you know, and, and several times you'd find that there's this mismatch where, um, you know, you're a founder, you're coming, you're pitching me brownies, and I say, man, you should be making souffle. The last thing you want is Super an investor bad. who's sitting there every day saying, man, I hope he gives up on those fucking brownies so then he can move, to, then he can move on to the souffle. Like, you don't want that as an right. investor. Right. Um, or, nor do you want an investor who's just co constantly coming in and, and, and trying to take over the kitchen. So, um, you know, so I, I totally killed the metaphor. But, um, you know, but, but basically that was a really hard, and it continues to be a hard challenge, because you realize that you're not backing your vision, you're backing the founder's vision. Um, and you have to have the shared alignment and shared excitement around that. Great. Um, let's, let's jump in a little bit to uh, visual tech and computer vision, what the summit's all about. Fourth annual year, we were ecstatic to have Howard last year and you this year from first round. Um, you guys have about four or five, six different companies that have different pieces or leverage visual technologies in different ways. I'd love to you know, highlight a couple of them that... Uh, Sure. You're, you're, you're close, what are you, what's going on? What, what, I see the processing, no, I know, so, so I know I, the I, processing I, of that phase drop for a, a long time. As I was thinking about what I was gonna say com coming up here, what's interesting is we don't have a vision thesis mm -hmm. um, in that we, you know, what's actually happened, 12 years ago we funded a company like .com, it was called RIA at the mm -hmm. time, and it was one of the first commercial uses of true, you know, of, of, of artificial intelligence trying to, try, you know, trying to commercially identify people in your photos, and then it pivoted to like.com and it was products. And that was one of the, that was a tech thesis on vision. But since then, especially recently, what we've seen is that vision has just become such a common part of the stack that when we looked at June Oven 
which is an oven that's internet connected, and you put something in the oven, and it detects whether you put in bagels or waffles or pizza or chicken or, 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 or salmon or scallops or asparagus, and it says, is this a, you know, screen says asparagus, you hit yes, and it just cooks you your asparagus because it knows exactly how long to cook it. We didn't view that as a vision sure. investment. When we did Gum Gum on the ad side, we didn't view that as a vision investment. When we did Planet Labs, which is satellites up in space, you know, taking a digital image of every place on the planet once a day, we didn't view that as a digital as a vision investment. And you know, I, I, I'm thinking back to when I first started in this industry. There was a conference in the internet industry in '91. I went to the first conference, Meckler Media. Do you remember Alan sure. Meckler? Absolutely. Um, Meckler Media had uh, Meckler Media was a big publisher back then, and they had a, they created Internet World. And I went to Internet World One and Internet World Two because Internet was this thing that was on the side of tech. It was experimental, and then over time. <laughs> the internet got so successful that internet world shut down um, it because it was anymore. just like world. You know? right. <laughs> like, like the internet was everywhere. Right. Um, you know, and coming here, to some degree, I feel like this is the early days of internet world. It's vision world. But, but at some point in time, you know, AI and vision just cease being a, a unique thesis and just become part of the stack so that we, we, we end up funding the applications of these technologies. But... You know, we fund plenty of mobile companies, but we're not sitting here with a mobile thesis. And we right. fund plen many, plenty of companies, many companies now, almost, I'd say, clearly a, pl a plurality of companies have some element of artificial intelligence in their product, but we don't have an AI thesis. It's just something that's become part of the default stack right now. Right. I, and I think you're absolutely right. Five years ago when I started the thesis for LDV and being a computer vision visual tech focus, Everybody thought it was too niche and, and yeah. cute and You're science fiction. You're the Alan fiction. Meckler of, of vision. But we're not going to die. Um, <laughs> and the cool thing is that I think what's uh, evolving is it's a big piece of the industry. It's a layer. Yeah. Um, and what's great is that there are this community here is focused on that layer, which might impact you know every single vertical out there. Oh, it should. Um, and so when you look at um, what, take example one of those companies um, that you mentioned okay. um, and say uh, in the earlier companies what was the what was the piece of the, the was the it was it a technology looking for a problem or like like.com in the early days and that well, was an issue like of was definitely a technology looking for a problem but I'd say most of the recent ones have been applications of technology applications so that we're sitting here saying um, you know, I'd say maybe Planet Labs is also, it's a, it's a data set looking for multiple solutions, right? Mm -hmm. By freely op creating an API to a daily photo of everywhere on the planet, you create an amazing data asset that people could tap into. But in most cases, it, you know, we're clearly funding applications. And, and you know, when I looked at some... We, we tend to not announce our investments till maybe nine to 12 months afterwards. And when I look back at some of them, our, our most recent investments, we have three or four of them that haven't been announced, whether it's an autonomous or retail or a ton of areas which, are, which have some element of vision-based technology incorporated in it. But again, for us, we're not funding the technology. We're funding the application of that technology. No, it makes sense. But that's why we're a great co-investor, because the deep domain expertise in the, in the sector, plus uh, 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 you guys, I think, is a great fit. The, um, looking now at these, all these companies that have computer vision and, 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 and are impacting sectors, which sector do you think is going to be most disrupted from vision? Well, I, know like, it, I know it goes against what you were just saying, you know, so, but, but, but take it, take it but a step I, further. If, you like if, I had to go, if I had to speak broadly, I think you know, having lived through the shift from the desktop computer to the internet-connected computer in, you know, in, the, in the early 90s, and then to mobile, um, I think autonomous vehicles uh, and, and their use and their application is, is, a, is, a, is just as big as the internet initial shift was in 90, you know, in the early 90s. Um, and, and people have barely begun to think about all of the, the business impacts that that, the second and third order effects of that, of that. And part of the challenge is, is sequencing it. You know, Howard, my partner Howard likes to say, you know, you, you, we invest at two places. We invest early or way too early. Um, and, and I know a blog like that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and, and 
you know, and, and there's a real challenge in being way too early in some of these technologies, right? Like, there was a company called Sudo, which was YouTube, back in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, and, and it was 10 plus years too early, um, and it died. And there were plenty of other players who did it. But, but if you look at how the internet first came out, right, and what companies won when the internet first came out, you had your big hardware, so you had your Cisco and your Sun, and the people that were basically just enabling connectivity. You had your consultancies, your Viant, Scient, March 1st, mm -hmm. US Web, CKS. Then you had then you had your shift from dial up to broadband, so like the the excites and the at homes. That's then why you, it worked. Yeah. Then you had your search portals, right? So you had Infoseek, Lycos, Yahoo, AltaVista, Hotbot, um, Ask Jeeves. Um, you had a few commerce players. Um, so how many people in the audience remember all of those names? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay, um, so that, that surprised me, but that's great. <laughs> but, but, I, I mean, all those, anyhow, that's, but they that's great. Each, they were, each one of those had a window that was investable. And I yeah, think as sure. you sit down and look at Autonomous, you want to uh, you know, sit down and say, where are we on that investable window? Because you don't want to fund YouTube 10 years too early. Um, you know, so you have to understand, are we in like the consultancy hardware phase? Um, you know, are we in the, you know, the, the, you know, the you know, full stack vehicles? Should we be selling? You know, is it the sensor sensor stack? Um, Who do you think we are? So we're playing. You know, we're playing it in a few few ways, um, and it's hard because most of the autonomous investments we've made haven't been announced. But we're playing in things that are are trying to solve common problems. So whether it's vehicles trying to understand human intent in a complex environment, whether it's um, how do you help regret? You know, one of the challenges with AI is you. You, you, you make an improvement to your AI, and now, now what do you have to do? You have to send it out and have it drive tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of miles to measure the improvement. So how can you do that in a regression testing way? Is there simulation approaches or other approaches to do that type of thing? So right now, we're playing in like those kind of areas um, rather than um, saying we're going to fund the next car company. So it sounds like it's, it's not the consulting area. It's not a full car. It's somewhere in the middle of the different layers that are, might be important. We're trying to figure out what are the learn. problems right. that everyone else is going to try to solve. So everyone is trying to solve regression testing. Everyone's trying to solve how do I predict what this bike rider or this pedestrian is going to do. Um, so when you think about those layers, we actually had a panel this morning that was talking about it with uh, 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 if, I mean, we're going to have a panel later today that talks about will the first chapter, let's say, of the autonomous vehicle sector be closed or open stacks? If they're closed stacks, it's hard to sell layers in of that technology. If it's an open stack, or if some are building an open stack, then you can sell those in. So how do you look at the businesses as far as so I, that kind of issue, almost back to the early days of the internet? So I think it's going to change. I think your, your, your autonomous is going to have to, by definition, change what tier one's, uh, what tier one do right. um, you know previously um, you know they owned a lot of the value prop now I think they're going to create rails that people develop technology on so I think there is going to be an opportunity but it's not going to be completely open like you're not going to be able to to, to choose the I, stack for your I car. I can't choose we earlier we talked about it, if you can choose the Boston style of driving or the <laughs> Texan style of driving you can't do that well that, there's a difference between creating a user feature versus actually <laughs> sort right. of allowing you to you know, and I think there's a big question also on, on, on retrofit that we're trying to figure out as well. Just when you look at the number of cars on the road, right? Like Tesla is probably the most innovative car company to come out in the last several decades. Um, last year, they sold 55,000 cars um, out of 12 million cars in the US. So when you sit down and look at how long will it take to truly get market dominance, um, you know, it, it, it's going to take longer, in terms of saturation on the road, mm -hmm. it's just gonna take a lot longer than people think. Right, makes sense. Um, let's get back to uh, kind of the entrepreneurs um, and tell us um, what would be, the, what are the biggest mistakes, and there's several blog posts, which I could have summarized 20 of them that you've written, or 30. Um, what, in that first, after you invest, to the next round of funding. So um, what are the three biggest mistakes that you see uh, in general? And what would be the advice to entrepreneurs to either learn quickly or avoid them? Well, I think a large part of you know, the, the key word you said is learn. There's a huge difference. I think the difference between a startup and a company is that a startup's goal is to learn, and a company's goal is to grow and mm -hmm. scale. Um, so what, what you're solving for in a startup is 
um, you know, the speed of learning and the dollar cost of learning. How expensive and how quickly do you learn? Um, and, and so, whereas a company, you're solving for cost of acquisition and how quick, you know, how, how expensive is it to grow? So a lot of what we're, you know, a lot of it comes out to trying to figure out, first off, it's amazing how many entrepreneurs, you know, they could, they, if you ask them to list what are the key risks, what are the unknowns, they could list them, but they don't differentially weight them. They don't sit down and say, these are the two or three things that we really need to prove between now and the next round. Uh, so, and, and so instead of, they, they, they try to make progress on all 20, whereas all 20 aren't really existential risks. Um, so I think, A, it's very important to understand specifically what you're trying to prove. Um, something I used to recommend, I haven't seen people do it lately, but to some degree, was when you close your financing round, you, know, you, you have the money in the bank, go out and create the slide deck that, you know, if you're going to go out and raise in 18 months, right now, write the slide deck that you want to pitch in 18 months. You know, you, if, you're, if you say you're going to be in market and your sales are going to do this and your cost of customer acquisition is going to be that, uh, like actually create the slide deck so that, um, you know, so then as you're going to do your next round, it's more a job of editing and, and, and trying to figure out like where was I right and where was I wrong. But it also forces you up front to, to, to focus on what those key questions are and those key assumptions. And probably not only write it, but share it with investors to get a sense of what, if that's a perception of what at least, be, at least share it with your existing that's investors. That's what I mean. In existing investors say, is this ballpark for uh, a, a feeling of a good raise? Because it comes back to the next question, which I think you're um, very astute since I've, we've met about what are the right KPIs, what are the right, you know, the, 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 the milestones that a company has to hit at different stages to succeed. There's nothing more frustrating than a founder and a team that spent 18 months um, Relentlessly working towards a goal, um, which is the wrong goal, and then find it's the wrong goal. Yeah, right. Like so, they've been training to clear this high jump that's set at eight feet, and they've been training and training, and finally they cleared it at eight feet. You know, but if only someone had told them it had to be nine feet, they would have. You know, <laughs> you know early on, they would have changed their training regimen. They would have done. They would have had more runway. They would have figured out a way to get it done. And so, so I think part of the challenge here is, is, is you know, when I see companies that have trouble with their round. And now sometimes it's the market changed on them, so sometimes you know they're you know the markets have secular uh, have, have cyclical views whether it's the market's view on e-commerce and as, as as first party third party and fundable fundable in that right. regard or other things. So there are clearly times where it's not the fault of the founder that the market changes, but there are plenty of avoidable um, fundraising challenges where they just didn't set the bar at the right place. Uh, we're going to start to have questions very soon. We could keep on talking forever, but I want to interact with everybody else. So start raising your hands, and our guys with the and gals with the mics will come and find you. Um, the so along those notes, you know, talk a little bit about uh, um, first round from the early days. Actually, a little later than the early days, but at a certain point, was the leader in building a platform for a fund. I would say, and a platform as far as different initiatives and even we went, I went to so early, actually it did start early, the CEO Summit was one of the first examples that I was a part of with you guys. Yes, okay. um, and so why that and uh, you know, tell us, give us a couple examples of how that's unique because I think there's actually similar aspects um, in LDV that there is in first round from learning from you guys to focus for our sector. So it kind of grew organically and what ended up happening is if you look at the traditional venture model and you say where does value, how does value get delivered? Uh, in most cases, if there's going to be value that's delivered from a venture firm, which is questionable <laughs> some of the time, but if you are going to get value, it's, it typically comes from the partner to the CEO, mm -hmm. which is why the conventional wisdom is to spend so much time diligencing the partner that you're going to choose when you're a founder. Um, but as I, uh, as, we, as I kind of shifted from operator um, to investor, one of the things I realized is the half-life on operating knowledge is amazingly short. So half.com was a top 10 e-commerce site in 2000. Um, but if you talk to, to founders today of e-commerce companies and ask them, say, like, what are your three, large, three top sources of customer acquisition, they'll tell you maybe social, mobile, paid search. Um, social, mobile, and paid search did not exist when I ran. None of them existed when I ran an e-commerce company. So if I'm going to deliver value in the boardroom, it's not coming in that, in, in that specific area on customer acquisition. It's not coming from my personal experience. So where does it come from? 
And, and what we've found is oftentimes it comes from what have we seen in other companies we've invested in. This is what Birchbox has done. This is what Warby Parker has done. This is what ModCloth has done. Right. And, and so what ends up happening is, is that we end up being a router for information. We see that one, com you know, that one company might have found an interesting solution, and we, we share it with another non-competitive company in the portfolio saying, have you tried this? Um, and, and so that kind of led us down the path where we said, oh, let's create a, a CEO mailing list. So we created, back in 2006, we created a Yahoo group, put our CEOs on it. And we saw some really interesting things. A, people are contributing and participating. B, an incredible amount of value delivery was coming from their peers rather than from their partners. I remember we were the seed investor in a company called Mint.com. Um, and Mint launched at TechCrunch Disrupt. And um, their goal, that, that was in October. The CEO of, spoke at that CEO summit that I went to. Yeah, so that, I think that was October of 2006 is when uh -huh. uh, they launched. And their, their goal from October to December, through the end of the year was to get 25,000 users. Well, they launched at Disrupt. They won first place at Disrupt. They had 27,000 users by the end of the first day. So they hit their, their, you know, their entire three-month goal <laughs> by the end of the first day, and their site completely crashed. So, it's Friday night. They call my partner, Rob, who's on their board. They call me and say, do you know how to scale MySQL? And we, <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how to scale MySQL. We said, but you know, let, let us try to call people. And we, you know, it's Friday night, but we're trying to call people. But we said, also, why don't you send it out to the CEO mailing list? So Aaron puts out on the CEO mailing list, need help. Um, and within 30 minutes or an hour, he was given Martin Mikos' phone number, who's the CEO, who was the CEO of MySQL, and a guy who had scaled an early implementation for Facebook. Right. And, and an hour after that, he was on the phone with Martin. It turns out there was some, uh, some caching variable that just got overloaded because no one expected 27,000 people to sign up in, in six hours once you cleaned the, once you purged the cache. That, it's that's fine. And, and, but what was interesting is Rob and I were still dialing, trying to get anyone to talk to us about scaling MySQL, and the network solved it. So we kind of started leaning into it. And we created a, a, a you know, and now we have three software engineers that work for us. We created our own online network. Um, the goal is to not just connect CEOs, but aspirationally to connect every employee of all the companies. So we have thousands of members, of, whether it's graphic designers, whether it's data scientists, whether it's general counsels, um, or whether it's marketing managers. And if you're, if you're a consumer marketing manager and you want to figure out how to get in the top rank to the app store, sure, you could talk to me. But you might get more value by talking to the person at Uber or Square or Hotel Tonight who did it all. And they're in the community. Right. So, and, and, and unintentionally, we learned something else, which is as a VC, we like to fund businesses that are um, software-based, not services-based, scalable, and not human-intensive. Uh, those are the companies we like to fund. Yet, when you look at what most venture firms are, their service is based. And they're not scalable. Non-scalable, right. ca human capital intensive. It's like VCs build the opposite business of the ones they like to fund. Whereas, if you could truly create value in an online network, um, there are real network effects, right? So the typical venture capitalist, if they're the one that's delivering the value, if I was point on five companies, I could spend a day a week with each company. As my portfolio grows and it grows from five to 10, now I can spend a day every other week. So with each new node we add to the network it, in traditional venture, it reduces the value of everyone else, which is the mm -hmm. definition of anti-network effect. Whereas if you could truly build an online community um, where people are, are, are sharing best practices online in a curated, trusted, confidential environment, mm -hmm. um, you actually get network effects. Because each time you add a company to the community, you're adding those people as resources to, based on their past, you know, past victories, their past challenges, and their past successes. I think it's fantastic. So, and, and that lead, that the, uh, you know, a lot of what we're doing here at the Vision Summit over the last four years is part of the analog pieces of that. And we're also building the online things. No, yeah, right? we, 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 yeah, we did this. Uh, well, one of the things we found is you can't just do it online. Yeah, you, gotta do, you, you need to have sure a level both. of trust and respect. Right. So we hold about 80, 80 in-person events a year for our community, for the companies we've backed, um, whether it's small dinner salons of 15 people to large CEO, CTO, other type of summits, cool. trying to connect founders. Let's ask who's got questions. Anybody have questions? Right there. I can't believe nobody else has questions. For those of us that have been in the business of imaging for 30 years, we started out in defense and then went through manufacturing. Now, uh, really post-defense, post-end of the Cold War is when consumerization of electronics really 
started to surge. That was the stated intent of the semi-business in those days. But manufacturing has, to some degree, migrated out of the United States, though, of course, it's you know growth opportunity in other nations. What does the VC community see in as much as the application of emerging vision technologies to manufacturing, even though manufacturing is not one of the sort of uh, perceived, though perhaps de facto, leaders of uh, market in the United States? So I'm not, A, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer the question either for myself, but definitely not qualified to speak for the VC community. What I, what I can say is that um, the software side of it is becoming baked into almost every product we're seeing. Um, you know, whether, whether, so that, um, you know, you're, you're, it's pretty rare that we're seeing technology that isn't using, that company, I'd say one out of three companies these days is using some form of vision-based technology. The question, though, is, you know, as to how that, you know, how that value accrues to the manufacturing sector versus to the software sector is a tough one. I don't have an answer to it. Uh, other questions over here. Alan McIntosh from Real Ventures. Josh, I wondered after, since 2006 you started, lessons learned with regard to decision dynamics, making these early or too early investment decisions. Yeah, so venture is a very humbling business. Because um, by, you know, by definition, um, if you're doing it well, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, both on companies you funded that you shouldn't have, but also companies that you passed on <laughs> that you shouldn't have. Our anti-portfolio at first round, whether it, you know, you're talking about Twitter, Dropbox, Zynga, Pinterest, we've seen all of them. We, issu we issued Dropbox and, and Twitter their first term sheets before other investors, and they're neither in our portfolio. So we, we try to study decision making a lot. Um, and, and so we've, we've iterated our process now. So some of the things we do, for example, are when a company comes in and presents to the partner meeting, um, and then the company leaves. We used to go straight into a conversation um, uh, amongst the partners about the pros and cons. And what we found there uh, over the years was that that conversation often gets dominated by strong personalities, strong voices, or heavy sa people with a strong sales mentality. You guys don't have strong personalities on your team, do you? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and you also, it also created a space where if someone did have a strong person, like someone did have a strong point of view, and someone kind of, it enabled intellectual laziness where someone else could say, oh yeah, I agree with him. Um, so one of the things we do now is after a company presents, uh, we open an app and we all write out pros uh, with thoughts on the team, thoughts on the market, thoughts on the product. And we're writing three or four paragraphs, take 15 minutes, um, and every partner writes this. It's called a pre-vote. And you then read it as a group and discuss that. And it enables you to figure out where there's, where there's overlap and agreement. But it gives no one has any place to hide because everyone, every voice is the same. Uh, it enables us to figure out where we need to do more work. Um, and, 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 and that change in process in, ter in, in terms of decision making to actually force people to codify and, and, and write out their thoughts transformed our partner meeting. Then afterwards, we do a final vote. And the other thing we do is we keep them, um, which is also really valuable. Because in venture, you know, so I have a history of every vote that we've taken for the past eight years, um, and ways that that could be applied. You have a principal that you're thinking about. He, he or she's been with you for several years. You're thinking about promoting that person to partner. Well, guess what? Even though their vote didn't count when they're principal, we still had them vote every single time. I could look back at the last four years they were there and say, had that person been a partner, would th what would their portfolio have been? Would it have been accretive to our, to our, to our decision making or, or value destroying? It also helps figure out superpowers and strengths. You could figure out that this partner is really strong at uh, enterprise SaaS, uh, at enterprise SaaS, but this this partner is really uh, you know doesn't have the strongest track record at assessing consumer internet teams, and it we don't we don't we don't say well you don't have a vote on consumer internet teams, so, so but it you helps. So but, have you weighted it? So then now the new voting, have you weighted it to we those don't, results? We don't weight it 
explicitly, but what it does do as a team is you begin to, once, you know, I think a blind spot um, exists because it's blind, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reason it's called blind spot is you don't know you have it. So having this data enables us to understand where people have superpowers and where people have blind spots. So you could, you know, so if I'm uncertain about an opportunity, you begin to understand where the, where the true expertise in the room is mm -hmm. rather than where the loudest speaker might be. Um, and so those are some of the types of systems we've put in place to try to help us improve our craft. Because fundamentally, even though we believe we add a ton of value to helping, company, to helping companies grow and scale, and we've, you know, we've helped companies, you know, Companies that we funded have gone on and raised billions and billions of dollars of capital after we funded them. We recognize that founders truly create the value. We're just providing help along the way. And that the bulk of our returns come from the byproduct of the decisions we make in that partner meeting. So we want to be extremely thoughtful. And we try to be extremely thoughtful about how we approach decision making. Cool. One more question from the audience. Yes. Just a silly one. Um, a what? Just a silly question. Yeah, I would love to know when and how did you come up with the idea of the holiday videos? I just fucking love them. I so don't for, know if anyone knows the holiday, them, like, oh, the holiday videos. Okay, yeah. short answer, Josh. For those of you who don't know, each year we put out a video of us and our companies participating, whatever the goofy internet meme was, whether it was Gangnam Style or, or the Old Spice videos. Um, and it really just started when, uh, when we were, at the very beginning, um, we were. A small fund didn't have a lot of fees, so we said, "How do we get? Yeah, you know, we got this quote. You know, we had 5,000 people in the contacts database, and it was going to cost $5,000 to send out a card that said the partners of First Round Capital wish you a joyous holiday season, which everyone would just open and throw away. So um, that year there was a viral video, Dancing Matt, which is this guy who went to 65 countries and just danced with people in those people in those countries. So he said, "Well, wouldn't it be cool if we just go to our 65 companies?" and just dance with the people in the companies. So we took out our flip cam, and we did it. And, um, and instead of getting 5,000 opens and throws, throwaways, it got 150,000 views. And then it just kept growing. So in the beginning, we did it purely for capital effectiveness reasons. Now, as it's grown, and the budget has grown, and the production values, there's no economic justification for it. Other than we, we really enjoy it, we find that it, it, you know, it also is a way to showcase Great the American. companies. Yeah. It's fun, and it, you know, it also shows that we, don't, we try not to take ourselves too seriously. OK, two last quick questions. This has been great. We could keep on going, but there's a lot more sessions to go. Um, one is uh, your favorite personality trait of entrepreneurs and your least favorite personality trait in entrepreneurs in one word answers. My favorite is an entrepreneur who says, I don't know, but I'll figure, I'll find out. OK, that's, that's more than one word. Yeah, well, sorry, I don't <laughs> <laughs> OK, go ahead, good. I like the answer, though, but um, I'm just saying, OK, one, and the one you dislike in one word. Least like a, favorite is the, is the opposite, I would say. The entrepreneur who believes that their job is to act as if there's no risk. So they, they you know, you ask them an unknowable question, and they give you an answer. Got um, it. Mine would be uh, determination and passion for what they're doing. Uh, and the last thing in a sentence answer, you know, statement, what would be your, the one advice to give to everybody that wants to build a successful business in like uh, concise? Um, I'd say focus on the pick. So that was concise. Now, do, I, do you want me to explain it or no? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but be concise with the explanation because we got to go. So I, I, you know, founders are going to spend <laughs> five, seven, nine years working on a business, right? If you're successful, the time to IPO from start is like is now nine years and growing. So you're going to spend a ton of time on your business. Um, and what I've seen is that there are founders who are really good at honing their craft at building a business, but are pretty crappy at picking the business idea they want to pursue. Uh, they sit down and give themselves arbitrary time frames. Well, I have three months before I need to pick the best idea that comes to me in the next three months. And, and, and there are so many times where I see a founder pitch, and I just sort of in, inside I'm saying, like, that idea is not worthy of the next eight years of your life. Um, and, and so as an investor, I said earlier that the bulk of our return comes from the pick, not the help we provide over the next eight years. I think as a founder, 
50 to 60, maybe even 70% of your upside is, is created not by how well you execute, but how well you pick. And, and I think there's a craft to picking that it's a muscle that many founders don't get to exercise because maybe they do it once or twice in their career, and then they go on and execute for, how many years did you execute for Digital Railroad? Eight. You know, how many? Eight. Eight, so you executed for eight, but you picked for less than eight months. Um, and and so, so for me, so much of the value is on the pick, and there's a craft to it, and, and, and I can go on and on about what to do and what not to do, but for me, I think a lot of money is created and lost, and a lot of years are, are, are lost by bad picks. Fantastic. Round of applause for Josh. Josh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you.